The following is a Goulash Media production. Goulashmedia.net. Welcome to the system is down. What's up, Downers? Hello and welcome back to another great episode of the least comfortable show on the web. The system is down. Thank you guys so much for faithfully tuning in every Monday morning for your weekly dose of conspiracies, politics, religion, and all things just politically incorrect and socially uncomfortable and unacceptable. Uh, If you're new here, you should probably go ahead and just give a big thank you to whoever told you about the show because today's episode, it's a doozy. Also, just fair warning, uh, today's topic is not a family-friendly one, so if the kids are in the room... You might want to put them to bed or put the earmuffs on or whatever. Uh, Get them out of the room. That's up to you. I'm not going to judge your parenting style. But anyway, let's talk about Bill Clinton. Uh, Regardless of your political position or regardless of all the allegations, people still seem to hear this guy's name and think, hey, he's this uh, funny, suave Southern gentleman who just happened to receive the world's most famous blowjob, right? Well, we, we've heard about these women who have made claims against him, but nobody seems to really take it seriously. Let's be honest. I mean, it, it can't possibly be true that we elected a rapist as president of the United States while millions of people are in jail for much lesser crimes like selling plants, you know? Well, today you're going to hear the the painful story of a lovely, sweet, and extremely brave lady who says that she was raped by our former president, Bill Clinton, and I believe her. I believe her. Um, and as I always say, if even a shred of this story was true, then a lot more people need to be talking about it. Why aren't we talking about this? This is a big freaking deal. And I will also say, just for the record, since this is kind of a conspiracy podcast of sorts, um, I am not suicidal. Just take that as you will. So... With all that said, and without further ado, here's my discussion with Juanita Broderick. My guest today is self-made entrepreneur and best-selling author of the book, You Better Put Some Ice on That, Juanita Broderick. Juanita, how are you doing today? So nice to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, honestly, I was kind of hesitant to even ask because I heard you on another podcast talking about it, and I, I mean, it's it can't be easy to keep telling the story over and over again, but it is an important one to be heard for sure. Oh, thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So, what what makes you keep telling this story? What what drives you to get this get the word out there about this incident? Well, Dan, there's so many people that do not know. I get uh, Twitter replies and Facebook replies and messages every day from people that say, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, as uncomfortable as it is, like I said, I think it's something that people definitely need to hear. Um, So just kind of start from the top. Tell us a little bit about you, your background, and how you came to know Bill Clinton. All right. Back in 1978, I was a registered nurse and a nursing home owner. And uh, my business was going along great, doing good. And I decided when I saw a bunch of commercials on TV about Bill Clinton uh, to go with a vol- to go to a volunteers meeting with some friends of mine. And so I got involved in volunteering. I would go around in the evenings and put up yard signs and hand out uh, Clinton information for his campaign. And that went along for about approximately 30 days. And then I had a call from the state headquarters, the campaign headquarters, and they they said that Bill Clinton was going to be in the area and could he come by my nursing home and tour and meet the families and the residents and the employees. And I said, yes, and we were so excited. That was uh, approximately the end of March or the 1st of April of 1978. And Mr. Clinton and all of his uh, entourage arrived at my nursing home. And it was, it was just an exciting day for us. And uh, we showed him around. 
And then the newspaper asks for uh, a picture, and that's the picture that you see so many times of Bill Clinton and myself and two of my residents. And after we took the photo, he uh, motioned Jimmy to come over to him, and I did, and and introduced myself. And and he was very charismatic. You know, the whole time that he talked to you, he he never left. He never lost eye contact with you. Mm -hmm. And so I had his full attention. So I began to tell him about, you know, the desperate situation that Arkansas nursing homes were in at that time. The reimbursement rate was so low. And he just seemed to perk right up and said, you know, we need to talk about that sometime. And uh, so uh, he said, are you ever in Little Rock? And I said, yes. In fact, I'll be there in about three weeks at a seminar. And he said, that's great. He said, when you get here, call my campaign office and uh, we'll try to get together and talk about this in detail. So that's ex exactly what happened. My nurse, Norma Rogers and I left for Little Rock after work on April the 24th, 1978. And we got there, checked into the Camilla Hotel. And then the next morning when we got up, we called his campaign headquarters. And a young lady answered, and I said, hi, this is Mrs. Hickey. That was my name at the time. Mm -hmm. I said, Mr. Clinton told me to call when I got to Little Rock. And she said, oh, yes, Mrs. Hickey. She said, Mr. Clinton said, if you ever called, to be sure and call him at this number. So I dialed the number, and he answered the phone. And he said, uh, I said, this is Juanita Hickey. And we're here and I brought all the information to discuss, you know, the reimbursement rate with you. And he said, I said, we have an hour at noon. Can we please come over there then and talk with you? And he said, you know, I'm not going to be in the headquarters today. He said, why don't I just come to your hotel now? And I just thought, man, that's, that's terrific. He really does want to know about the problems we're having. And he said, I'll just meet you down in the Camelot coffee shop. I told him where we were staying. And he said, I'll just meet you downstairs. I'll call you when I get there. So I turned to Norman and I said, you go on to the meeting. We were both ready to go to the meeting. And I said, you go on to the meeting. And as soon as I get through in the coffee shop, I'll be right there. And so Dan, I just waited in the room and I ordered coffee to the room. And uh, in a little while, he called from downstairs and said, uh, you know, it's just so crowded down here and there's reporters. He said, can we just talk and have coffee in your room? And I said, yes, that's just great. You know, so that's when I ordered the coffee to the room. Mm -hmm. The coffee came and a few minutes later, there was a knock on the door and I go to the door and it's Bill Clinton and the strangest thing, you know, just went over me because he was standing out in the hallway with his sunglasses on. And I thought that was rather strange, but I ushered him on into the room sure. and um, he came in. He immediately took off his suit jacket, laid it across the chair and walked over to the window where I had the table and the coffee there. So I walk over, begin to pour the coffee and he says, come here and look at this. So I walk around the table to where he's standing and he begins to point to a little building down below. And uh, as he points, he begins to explain that this is an old jailhouse that if he becomes governor, he wants to restore to the original uh, 1800 uh, uh, restoration of it. Sure. But as he points, Dan, he puts his arm around my shoulder. And that made me very uncomfortable. And so I began to back away from him. And as I did, he sort of grabs me and pulls me to him and starts kissing me. And I immediately push him away. And I said, uh-huh, you know, no, this is, this is not what uh, uh, I had in mind. I need to talk to you about some things. And he pulls me back and tries it again. And I just start saying no and try to explain to him that this is, this is not right. You know, this is not what I allowed you to come to my room for in so many words. And that's when 
the situation gets very panicky. He grabs me again, and I start to yell. You know, I, I, I'd never been in a situation like this. And course, I, yeah. I was beginning to panic. I couldn't believe it. You know, I'd never known anybody that had been in a situation like that. I had never been in a situation like that. And I was thoroughly frightened. Mm -hmm. And so when I yelled, he would grab me and try to kiss me. But at the same time, he would bite on my upper lip. And it was very painful and just frightening. Just I, I, I can just almost still remember it to detail. And from then on, I really don't like to discuss what happened. Oh, sure. Yeah. But it was, it's just mind boggling right now to even remember back and think about what happened to me. And I was, I was raped, you know, my clothes were torn. My mouth was swelling. Uh, it was just a horrific incident. And after it was over, I sat up on the side of the bed and I'm sitting there wondering what, pardon me, in the expression, hell had just happened to me. Right. And he gets up and he starts to straighten himself. And I sit up on the side of the bed and I am, I am crying out loud at, by this time. And he just looks at me and he has this look of frustration and bewilderment. Like he's perplexed, you know, why I'm crying. It's just like, this was an, an everyday thing to him. Mm. And he, and, and he makes the most bizarre statement to me. And he looks at me and he says, you know, I'm sterile. I had mumps when I was a child and I'm wow. sitting there thinking, what in the heck? I've just been raped. And that's what you have to say. Right. And he just, he just calmly walks to the door, puts on his sunglasses and with his hand, he motions to my mouth. And he says, you better put some ice on that. And he walks yes. out the door. He just wow. walks out the door. So did he, when you were, you know, refusing and resisting him did he say anything at that time to try and convince you or was it all just physical force completely all physical i was the only one that was making any uh noise or, or anything there, there were there it was nothing absolutely nothing wow so to clarify not get into detail just to make sure everybody knows the you know the impact of this it, it was actual rape it wasn't just you know um, oh yes that's exactly okay. what sure. i told lisa myers in 1991 when she asked me she said this was rape and i said oh mm -hmm. yes, this sure. is right okay now tell me about the aftermath um uh, i've heard that you had some interactions with uh hillary clinton afterwards uh tell tell me a little bit about that right well, shortly after the rape, I just laid back down on the bed and just didn't want anything to do mm -hmm. with life or anything. I rushed over and locked the door because I felt like someone was going to come in and get rid of the body. Sure. And so a few minutes later, there's a knock on the door and I go through the, to the door and it's my nurse that I brought down for the seminar. And I look through the peephole and I see it's her and I open the door. And when she sees me, the look on her face, I mean, it was, it's hard to describe, mm -hmm. you know, the horror on her face when she saw me. And so I started crying all over again. So she came in, helped me change my clothes, got ice for my mouth mm -hmm. and uh, said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go home. I just, I just want to go home. And we stopped several times on the way home so she could get ice for my mouth. And we knew that there was nothing we could say that there's absolutely nothing that I could say about this. This man as attorney general and then as governor regulated my nursing homes mm -hmm. he had complete control over the, the regulation of my nursing home. And he was the attorney general. You know, they say, why didn't you call the police? You know, he was the police. Right. 
I couldn't, I couldn't tell anybody, uh, but I did tell others, you know, after I got back. I guess I was in a daze for the next probably month. Oh, sure. When I was volunteering, I helped arrange a campaign fundraiser with my dear friends, Buddy and Betty Criswell. They had a beautiful home here in my town. And we had arranged for a campaign fundraiser for the Clintons there at their home. I played tennis with Betty. Buddy was my dentist. And as the days progressed, this was about three weeks after the rape. And as it progressed, I had told Betty, I said, something's come up and I'm not going to be able to be there that night. I said, but I'm going to come up, bring you some information. And I had some checks that people had given me for his campaign when I would go out and put up yard signs. So I said, I'm going to bring you those to give to the campaign people, but I won't be able to stay. Mm -hmm. So I went up, gave her all the information. And just when I was about to leave, it was about 15 minutes before the game, the fundraiser began. I see a friend of mine come through the kitchen and the one that had driven them from the uh, airport. He was a dear friend and the local pharmacist. His name was Chuck Watts. And he came over to me and uh, he said, I just want to tell you that the whole conversation from the airport was Bill and Hillary asking me questions about you. Mm. And I just froze. I thought, oh, God, I've got to get out of here. Well, about that time, I see Bill and Hillary coming, in, coming through the back kitchen area. And so I start to head for the front door. But before I could get there, here comes Hillary. And she's coming straight for me. And as she walked to me, Dan, I thought, here comes this poor woman that's married to that monster. How am I going to even speak to her, you know, on any intelligent level? And she comes over to me and she says, I just want you to know. She takes hold of my hand and she says, I just want you to know how appreciative Bill and I are for everything that you do in this campaign. I have no idea if I said anything. I just, I may have just nodded my head. And so I turned to walk away. And as I do, I feel somebody grab me, grab my arm. And I, I think it's somebody that's going to just tell me goodbye. I turn around and it's Hillary Clinton. And she has a hold of me. And she pulls me close to her. And that pleasant smile that she greeted me with is now this scowl, I mean a frown. And in a low voice, she says to me very threateningly, and she says, do you understand everything you do? I could have fainted. And I mean, I jerked my arm from hers and I left. Yeah, so, so you took that to mean she was aware and she wasn't just a victim of uh, her husband. Oh, exactly. You know, and that I'll just never forget. And, you know, later when Andrea Mitchell asked me, she said, well, how do you know that's what she meant? You would have had to have been standing in my shoes right. at that very moment in time and seeing the look on that lady's face and know that I was being threatened. There, right. There's no doubt in my mind how much she knew. I have no idea. But right. at that moment in time, I felt like she knew what had happened to me. Yeah. Uh, like you said, you got to be there. You have to see the body language and uh, to know the intent. The words uh, don't necessarily imply anything, but coming from you, I mean, you're a sweet, wonderful lady, so it, it doesn't come across quite as, you know, as uh, aggressive as I'm sure it was at the time, for sure. It was just like I was raped all over again. Mm. It was just like a slap in the face. Be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow. crazy stuff for sure. Um, so tell me about the cases with uh, Paula Jones and um, everything that happened there. Uh, why, why you did not come forward initially. Before I do that, though, I'd also like to say that Bill Clinton would call my office for up towards, up towards uh, two months after the rape. And I would tell my receptionist, 
tell him I'm not here. And that was uncomfortable because mm. she didn't know what had happened and had no idea why I didn't mm. want to talk to, to Bill Clinton, of all people. But about the third or fourth time that he called, I answered the phone because they were at lunch. Really? And when I answered the phone, uh, I heard a voice say, when I told the, you know, when I answered the phone with, you know, Brownwood Manor, Mrs. Hickey, how can I direct your call? He said, hi, this is Bill Clinton. He said, when are you coming to Little Rock again? And I, I just hung up the phone. I mean, the audacity. But I did want to tell you that. Yeah. So then we go on further. I, I manage to keep my, my wits about me and stay silent for almost 20 years. You know, my business was going along well. I had remarried. I had a happy life. And this is something I never wanted to tell. I never wanted, because I could see what happened to the other women that came forward. But then all of a sudden one day, I get this letter through the mail that I'm going to be deposed by the Paula Jones attorneys. And so I went to my attorney and my son went with me, who's also an attorney. And we told my attorney, I said, I don't want in this. I don't want involved in this. I don't want to be absolutely thrown to the wolves like everybody else has. And I will not be a part of this. So that's when I told him I would deny the accusations that I had made. So that's what I did. And uh, then everything was fine. I know the Paula Jones attorneys were extremely upset. Right. They had sent an investigator to my front door and recorded me making some comments that were uh, that leaned toward the right. Uh, so they were not very happy about that. But I did deny it. Um, what was the reason? I mean, did you just not want that spotlight on you? Not want, like you said, to be thrown to the wolves, just you no. wanted to move past and go on with your life and forget that it happened? I wanted, I had gone on just fine for 20 years. Well, not just fine. I had a lot of problems uh, after the rape, but I, had, I was managing my life. Right. And for someone to come in for their own personal gain and try to draw me and out me was just so objectionable to me. Sure. And that's why. Do you regret that now? Do you regret not coming forward sooner at the time? Well, possibly, you know, I, I do because I was forced out by Ken Starr. So it had really, I had done no good by denying it because right. Because eventually, just a few months later, my attorney got a letter from Ken Starr. And he called my son first. And my son came over, called me and said, Mom, we need to talk. And he said, Paula Jones' case was civil. He said, Ken Starr is federal. He said, you're going to have to tell the truth. And I just, I just said, I can't. And he said, I know how you feel, but it's time. You're going to have to come out and tell the truth. So that's what I did with the Ken Stars people. Now, um, did that did that case? I, I'm not super familiar with how the, all that legal system works, but did that out you to the world? Like, did people have your name tied to these Bill Clinton accusations at that point? No, because there had been so many rumors around Arkansas. See, after the rape, I told approximately five to six people, and it gradually filtered out to all areas of the United States, you know, that this was a possibility. Then I finally came forward, told the truth, and he had to deny it. Uh, but like I said, it had filtered out uh, to so many people. There was even a letter written by a man named Philip Yoakum. He was a, a friend, a salesperson that would come to the nursing home. And I feel like someone one of my friends must have told him what had happened. He and Sheffield Nelson wrote a letter to, I don't know if it was the Washington Post, the Washington Times, but several news organizations saying, in essence, that I had told him I had been raped and I had been bought off by the Clinton organization not to come forward. So this is what prompted Ken Starr to come in because of what he was investigating. But after Ken Starr came forward, the main uh, 
questions they had for me was, had I been bought off? Had I been threatened to keep quiet? And of course I had to tell the truth. That was strictly my choice to right. stay quiet. No one had bought me off or no one had threatened me other than Hillary Clinton back in 1978. Yeah. So at what point did you, you know, switch gears, change direction and say, I'm telling everybody I'm going for this. I'm going to, you know, let it be on me. Take that burden to let the world know that this is happening. Well, early in 1998, I started getting the letters from Lisa Myers from NBC. And she started, she sent me beautiful letters and would tell me, you know, it's going to come out. So do it on your own terms. Don't wait till somebody can spin the story on their own. Right. She and I talked back and forth for about a year. And then after the, uh, uh, star interview, I did contact her and say, yes, I'll do it. And so I did the interview. They came to tape in early January of 1999. And it was finally aired in, uh, on, uh, February 24th, 1999 NBC Dateline. So that's when I mainly came out. And of course the media attention then was just horrific. It right. was, it was horrible. I couldn't even go to Walmart without a ball cap or sunglasses. And then I'd see my face on the front of National Enquirer or all of those rag magazines. Right. So it was really horrible. Uh, it, it caused so many complications in my life because so many people in Arkansas were still for Bill Clinton. Right. They were very adamant that I was not telling the truth. So it was, a, it was a very difficult time for myself and for my husband at that time. And um, uh, our marriage didn't survive that sure. at all. It was just too much on us. So then I went back to work and tried to just gear myself into my business again mm -hmm. and stay pretty quiet until 2015. I mean, I just laid back. I didn't do anything. And then in 2015, I see on television, Hillary Clinton, and her statement was to some university uh, women's group there, that all victims of sexual abuse should come forward and be believed. Wow. And I almost I, I just went ballistic. I couldn't yeah, believe it. Of all people. And so, and she had done that on Twitter. I had no idea how to use Twitter. I didn't know <laughs> what to do whatsoever. Sure. <laughs> and it kept coming around on TV and I thought, I've got to learn how to use Twitter. Right. One afternoon I called my grandson when he got home from school and he walked me through what I needed to do. And I did that. But these little red letters kept coming up, numbers. Mm -hmm. so I called him back and I said, I can't get it to go through. And he said, Nana, you've got too many letters in there. Right. You've got to reduce it down. So I worked on that and, and uh, got it down to where there wasn't any red letters come up. And then I thought, I'm going to tweet this. It's not mm -hmm. anything that I haven't said for the last 20 years. And I need to answer her. Right. So that's when I sent out that tweet uh, that went viral immediately. Right. And it, it, I clicked tweet, and within 30 seconds, my phone was ringing. <laughs> Listen, Dan, I had no idea the power of Twitter. Yeah. I mean, I, I, had, I, had, I had no idea that it was worldwide and instant. And so in a few minutes, one of those phone calls was my son. I said, Mom, what did you do? I said, I have no idea. Right. I have no idea. What, what, what did the tweet say? It said, um, when I was 35 years old, I'm trying to remember it. Mm -hmm. When I was 35 years old, I was raped by Arkansas, Arkansas Attorney General Bill Clinton mm -hmm. and threatened by Hillary. I'm now 73. It never goes away. Wow. And it was just the truth. Yeah. It was the truth. 
And, that, and, and I'm guessing that Hillary didn't respond and say, I believe you, right? <laughs> no, no, but she did take, I believe, uh, you should be believed off of her website within a week. Oh, geez. Yep. Hey, Dan Smots here. I'm taking a second to interrupt myself talking to talk about myself because, you know, I don't get paid a penny for the hours and hours that I put into creating this show for you guys in your greedy little ears. And I've got a family to feed. To make that happen, I run my own media business called Goulash Media. If you have a need in anything from video production to graphic design to audio production and beyond, you can get it all for a painfully fair price at Goulash Media. In video, I do weddings, music videos, commercials, pageants, plays, etc., etc., etc. For design, I do photo editing editing, album art, logos, branding, business cards, merchandise, you name it. For audio, I do engineering, production, editing, jingles, and, well, podcasts. So if you've got a media need of any kind, or if you'd just like to give a little something back and help keep my children fed, check out all the endless options at my website, goulashmedia.net. That's goulash, G-O-U-L-A-S-H, media.net, where we cater to the little guy with the big vision. (sighs) Okay. Uh, has Bill Clinton made any statements about all these accuser, or accusers and accusations, or has he talked to you or been in contact since then? Yes. I had uh, a letter in 1984. Uh, like I told you, I just delved into my business. I made mm-hmm. myself a very successful business person trying to forget. I, I, did, yeah. I worked <laughs> 24 hours a day almost. Mm-hmm. And so my nursing home received an award from the governor's office and from the Arkansas Department of Human Services for being the best nursing home in the state of Arkansas. So when I opened this letter, I still have it, scrawled across the bottom in Bill Clinton's handwriting, it says, I admire you very much, Bill. I mean, it was just like a a message from the past, uh, thanks for being quiet. Right. And then in 1991, I was down at, in Little Rock at a nursing home meeting with Norma Rogers, the lady that was with me the, the, the day that I was raped, and her sister, Jean Darden. And we were down there at a nursing home meeting. And just before noon, somebody comes to the door and says, Juanita Broderick is wanted in the hall. So... I go out there, afraid that it's an emergency from home. Mm -hmm. And the man, when I get out in the hallway, he points down around the corner by the elevator. And he said, you're wanted down there. I walk down around the corner, and there stands Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. And he's got two bodyguards or state policemen or whatever with him, but they're standing sort of back from him. He comes over to me, tries to take my hand, and I just back up. And he starts this profuse apology that, and says, I'm so sorry for what I did. And he said things like, I'm a changed man, family man. I'm not that person anymore. I'll never forget those words. And then he just stands there and looks at me with this blank expression because he must have seen the horror on my face. And I look back at him and I say, you go to hell. Mm-hmm. I walk off. Yeah. And I started crying. I mean, and by the time I get back about 50 feet to my friends who followed me out, I, they said, who was that? And I said, that was Bill Clinton. I said, he just apologized to me. I, we couldn't believe it. And so we went to lunch and we started to talk about this and stupid me. I made statements and I said, do you think he really means it? You know, and then I got to feeling sorry about oh, yeah. to go to hell, that maybe this man was trying to, to make amends for the horrible thing that he did to me. Mm-hmm. And I, that was in my mind for the next two weeks until he announced he was running for president. <sighs> Jeez. <laughs> of course. You know, it just, I, I, I hated that I'd ever given him the benefit of the doubt. Right. So yeah, you're. I mean, you're obviously past the six-year statute of limitations to you know press charges and everything at this point. Um, do you know? Are there any other accusers now that are more recent and still within that window that have come forward uh, making no, any claims? All the ones that I know were back in my time. Sure. You know, okay. uh, I had two different ladies contact me that said that told me that they were almost right. Uh, 
but somebody else intervened because he was drunk at the time. And, uh, but they were very apologetic, you know, that they, they couldn't come forward. Their families wouldn't allow them to come forward. Right. Now, what can you tell me about uh, Kathleen Wiley or Willie, I think Willie. is her name, and yeah. uh, Paula Jones? Um, were, their, uh, were their claims similar to yours? No, no, that it wasn't. Theirs was sexual uh, assault without rape. Okay. Now, Paula Jones was less, to a much less degree than Kathleen Willie's because Kathleen Willie was groped and, and, and manhandled you know, in the Oval Office. Uh, but Paula Jones was brought to a room and, and asked to perform acts on him and left, you know. So there was really no contact that I know of between Paula Jones. It was just an affront to her dignity. Sure. Yeah, and the thing that kind of gets me the most in this is... Hillary Clinton. I mean, in a normal relationship, if, you know, multiple women come forward saying that a married man is not only cheating on his wife, but he's raping other women, uh, you know, the, the person who would typically be the most concerned would be the wife. Um, that's how it would work in a normal family and not a family that's trying to run the world. But, uh, you know, has, has Hillary Clinton ever talked to you directly about the incident or asked you any questions about the allegations or anything to that effect? Oh, no, she's avoided the subject completely. And right. we've been asked in town hall meetings and things about us. She tries to say that the claims have been disproved. And that's that's ridiculous. You know, even uh, Andrea Mitchell, after I came forward, uh, mm -hmm. uh, she uh, went on the Today Show in June of uh, 2016 and said that my... Uh, claims were long denied and discredited. Listen, my son sent off a letter to NBC threatening a lawsuit if they did not remove discredited from any future airings of that. And it took about a week, but they finally did. Uh, I think there's one still on YouTube that says discredited, but everything's been removed now from their website that says discredited. Well, did they make any, did they say how it's discredited or what it is that points to this not being true? Was it just that you just that uh, didn't denied, testify initially? That he denied it and that I had denied it in the first uh, right. deposition. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's got to be rough watching not only Bill Clinton be president for, what, eight years, uh, now seeing Hillary trying to you know, take that position and everything. And she's, I mean, she presents herself as, you know, championing for women's rights. I mean, how does that make you feel? And what would you say to people that support that? Oh, it's the most, it's the most disgusting claim that could ever be. This mm -hmm. woman and her war on women absolutely hounded and ridiculed us uh, for so many years, every time you know, we would try to come forward or say anything. She mm -hmm. is no champion. She's only champion for one person mm -hmm. and one woman, and that's herself. Right. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Um, it seems like people who make waves against the Clinton family have a much harder time in life, <laughs> and sometimes they have a shorter life, some would say. Uh, has there been any pushback, any threats, or anything uh, toward you Uh while they're, I mean, they're still the most, like one of the most powerful families in the world. Have you seen anything like that? No, I've not seen anything like that. Okay. Uh, after that con confrontation I had with him in Little Rock, where he apologized, it worried me because I thought about how does he know where I am? Right. You know, I had no idea that he was keeping an eye on me and that worried me. So I did have a large fence and security gate and a deluxe burglar alarm, and I bought a Smith & Wesson. <laughs> sure. <Yeah. laughs> so, you know, I've, uh, I feel very protected where I am with my neighbors around that yeah. always ask, you know, you know, if anyone tries to uh, get near my house. Sure, yeah. Now, with this, um, this r most recent election, Donald Trump got in touch with you and brought you forward. Uh, can you tell us how that all went down and... Um, yeah, just a little bit on that. 
Sure. In October, before the second debate, Kathleen Willey and Paula Jones and I uh, flew to uh, New York, no, to Washington, pardon me, mm -hmm. for an in-depth interview with Aaron Klein on Breitbart. And we filmed this over at the old uh, Watergate Hotel over a period of two days. Very mm -hmm. exhausting. And I don't know if you've seen that interview or not. But it's I have seen clips very, of it, yeah. Very, very exhausting. Yeah. When that was over, uh, I went by CNN and did an interview with Jake Tapper. And then I had to rush to the airport. When I was on the plane getting ready, the day before the debate, when I was flying back to Arkansas, I had a phone call. I hadn't turned my phone off yet when I was on the plane. And it's the Trump Organization, and they're uh, asking me to appear uh, with President Trump the next night, the very next night, and I'm on my way to Little Rock. Oh. I mean, to uh, Arkansas. Yeah. And so I had to think about it. I said, I have a layover in Dallas, so when I get there, let me call the other ladies and my son and, and talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so it all ended up, yes, we were going to, we were all three going to go there. And we, uh, I got home at one, got on a plane the next morning back at six o'clock and was in St. Louis by around 10 o'clock. And we were completely hidden the whole day. Mm -hmm. uh, no one knew that we were there. Yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, it was really something uh, how we were, they wanted no one to know where right. we were in St. Louis. And then we went to President Trump's hotel to meet him before the debate. And we were taken to this beautiful room on the top floor of his hotel there. And uh, we met him, so nice, so congenial. Came up with each one of us and, and talked with each one of us at length and very soft-spoken. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they asked, the three, the four of us, it was also Kathy Shelton, mm -hmm. uh, the young 12-year-old uh, that was raped, that, he, that Hillary de defended uh, the rapist. Uh, mm -hmm. We were ushered into this room, and here's this long table, and there's five chairs at it, and we were told where to sit. And so we go in and sit down, and I look at Kathleen, and I say, what are we doing in here? We had no idea that we were going to be asked to make statements. <laughs> None whatsoever. So yeah. we go in and sit down. In a few minutes, Mr. Trump comes in, sits down between us, and uh, he says, let them in. <laughs> and I turn and look at Kathleen, and I say, let who in? And she says, oh. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the door opens, and here comes all these cameras and reporters and they just almost stop in their tracks and they're looking at us. I understood <laughs> later that they thought they were just coming in to talk to Donald Trump. Right. So they come in the door and I, we look like a deer in a headlight looking back at them, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And so they come in and we're still puzzled. And Mr. Trump says, thank you for coming. These nice ladies have something they'd like to say to you. <laughs> And I thought, like we do. <laughs> what? What? I don't know if somebody didn't tell us yeah. or if uh, uh, this was designed this way. Listen, I'd do it all over again. Sure. No, I didn't know. I would do it all over again. So yeah. thank God they started down on the other end with Paula Jones. I had right. to try to think about what in the heck I was going to say. <laughs> uh, so started with her and then Kathy Shelton. And then Donald Trump turns and looks at me and I thought, and I'd been thinking about what I was going to say because the Access Hollywood tapes had just come out. And right. I had tweeted, uh, actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. Bill Clinton raped me. Hillary Clinton threatened me. And I don't think there's any comparison. So that's where I went with that because he had retweeted it and it had got a lot of notice. So that's mainly what I said, you know, and I, I felt that. There was no comparison to what the Clintons had done to me than an Access Hollywood tape 10 years ago. Right. Yeah. And he took you also to the debates, right? Right. Right. And that's where you see that picture of Bill Clinton with his eyes all bugged up. <laughs> that's yeah. when we were walking into the room. That's when he, well, I'm sure he had heard about the uh, press conference, but that's right. when he first knew that we were in-house. Nice.
It's a very, very interesting move. Um, very cool. Um, do you feel, I mean, do you have a problem with being used in that capacity? Kind of, I mean, you said before that you didn't want to be used in the Paul Jones case as kind of a prop, but he was kind of uh, doing the, something similar. But uh, do you feel, you know, any problem with that? Sure, I feel like it's very similar, but we had been told to go back in the woodwork for decades that nobody wanted to hear from us. Right. If we were being used, he was being used also because this gave us an opportunity to come out and tell our stories again. Mm -hmm. Millions who had never heard it, who, who didn't even know who those four women were that were walking in the room that were causing. I didn't know at the time. <laughs> yeah, that were causing so much commotion. Who are mm -hmm. these women? And then I was taken uh, to the spin room and just talked to all these reporters and told them why I was there. That meant a lot to me. Absolutely. Are you, if you don't mind me asking, are you a Donald Trump supporter or were you just there to help? No, by that time I was, sure. I was a Donald Trump supporter. Sure. Uh, in June, when uh, Hannity interviewed Donald Trump mm -hmm. and Donald Trump made that statement and rape. Mm -hmm. I could have fallen out of my chair when I heard that. I mean, rape was a word that I didn't use. I used sexual assault. Rape right. was too descriptive, and it just brought back too many memories. And the day that he said that on national TV, it allowed me to say it from then on. Sure. And I had become a supporter just prior to that. But that really made me a supporter, that he supported my efforts in uh, saying that I was raped by Bill Clinton. Yeah. And I'm still a Donald Trump supporter. I wish he wouldn't tweet. <laughs> <laughs> but yep. I'm still a Donald Trump supporter. As you know, Twitter can be a dangerous thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do now. <laughs> I had about a thousand people that first time I tweeted and now I've got about 80,000. Mm -hmm. so it's just, it's my life. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, there are people who say that Donald Trump is a sexist or uh, I think they're – I can't point to any cases, uh, not that I'm I, – I just don't know about them uh, where people are saying that he's being accused of sexual misconduct as well. Uh, does that sway your opinion of him at all? Uh, it always bothers me, but it also bothers me that none of these have come to fruition. Sure. You know, they've been claims and they're very old claims, and many of them were – uh, instigated by Gloria Allred. So that bothers me. If any, listen, I'm a victim first and I believe in victims having their say and having their due process. But I also believe that victims should be scrutinized and investigated and that hasn't happened. So, uh, you know, I'm just right there waiting, you know? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of yelling with not a lot of substance that I've seen, for sure. Um, yeah. So has Donald Trump, uh, has he been in contact with you since then? Has he invited you to any of his other events or anything like that? No, no. I've been okay. pretty active as far as campaigning for sure. him, except on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. I did and know he, the inauguration, though, and that was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, you say that you're a victim first. I would say that you are an amazing woman and a very brave woman first and foremost uh, to come out and tell, share your story. Um, you, any, any rape victim is brave to share their story, let alone uh, against somebody in such high power. Uh, you don't let it define you, which I think is fantastic. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, now, how do you feel about, uh, I think it was just within the last couple of days, Monica Lewinsky coming back out and uh, making the statement that she's changing her mind now. I mean, she's, she said over and over again that it, her incident was consensual, but now she's saying that maybe she had PTSD and she's kind of rethinking and maybe he took advantage of her. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I don't know how this is all going to play out. Mm -hmm. I just tweeted yesterday or the day before that I truly believe she has been a victim. So right. many people say, no, she knew what she was doing. Listen, she was 22 years old mm -hmm. and she was absolutely in love with this man. I have right. 
absolutely no doubt. He was the president, the most powerful man in the world. Right. And I feel like he abused his uh, his his position mm -hmm. you know, with her and used her terrifically. But I also feel bad that Monica Lewinsky has never ever given his other victims the time of day. Right. You know, I would truly like to know, Monica Lewinsky, do you believe us? You know, do you have any idea? If you think you've gone through a lot, do you have any idea what unwilling victims of Bill Clinton have gone through? Right. Absolutely. And do you believe us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially, I mean, it just seems like with the whole hashtag Me Too movement that it seems convenient that now she's kind of going, saying the opposite thing, like that she is more of a victim. It seems just a little bit suspicious because that's what the trend is now. Is to... and, and the Me Too thing, listen, I've got my own views on that Me Too thing. Sure, give them to me. <laughs> long before it was cool to be Me Too. Right. <laughs> and no one that instigated the Me Too thing, that brought it into a, a realization, ever, ever acknowledge me. Right. Or the other Clinton victims, they wanted nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. When Time Magazine contacted me to make a statement for the Me Too, for they were gonna be in an article, no one knew at that time they were gonna be the person of the year, uh, uh, Charlotte Alter contacted me and said, uh, we'd like to interview for you for the Me Too thing. And I said, Charlotte, I'm not a part of that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so so away from that. And I said the same thing to her. I was Me Too before, long before these ladies were. Right. She said, well, would you just give a statement to us about the Me Too? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And I did this nice long statement in support of Me Too and how I thought it was such a good thing. And then all of a sudden, a few days later, I see that they're person of the year. So, man, I go to the article and think, <laughs> I can't wait to see my comments because I did support them. Uh, it wasn't there. Really? And I contacted Charlotte and she said, well, we just had so many statements, Juanita. We just had to uh, uh, publish the ones we thought were the most important. Hmm. And I thought, well, thank Bill, you. Vic Bill Clinton raped? Accusation isn't important at all. <laughs> and I was, I was indignant about that. I thought it was yeah. such a, but the Hollywood people got their picture on the front of Time magazine. But whatever happened to those millions of women and men that came forward and said, me too. Mm -hmm. They're just out there floating around in internet space and they've never had a, any, any time or any, any way to process. They've just been thrown away. And that's what I think is pathetic about the whole Me Too thing. Absolutely. Now, uh, with the movement, um, it, it seems like uh, it takes very little evidence these days to convince people that a male celebrity is a sexual deviant, not, not speaking, you know, in favor of them, obviously, but like you said, they, there needs to be due process. Um, do you feel like that, like you are currently getting the same courtesy th that they're giving these other women by just taking them at their word and face value and uh, believing that, you know, all these male celebrities are deviants. Are you yeah. getting the same courtesy? Yeah, I, of course I am. You know, I think, I, if Hillary Clinton had won, there would be no Me Too movement at all. Mm -hmm. It would be non-existent. And I think that when Michelle Goldberg came out and said, I believe Juanita in New York Times, that was probably the biggest um, validation that I'd had to date. You know, other than Lisa Meyer's belief in me all those so many years ago. But then Chris Hayes came out on MSNBC and said that uh, uh, Bill Clinton should be investigated. All of those accusations from way back when. So did Jake Tapper. And so did uh, Joe Scarborough. Joe Scarborough on MSNBC 
even said that people who had come on his show back during the Clinton uh, investigation and impeachment would even make comments to him off air that they knew that he had raped someone. Hmm. And, you know, he even said that on air. I'm surprised he still has a job. Uh, but so many are coming forward now. Liberals are coming forward now and know that we had a valid uh, accusation back then. And that helps. Absolutely. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about uh, your book. Um, we haven't talked much about that. Um, yeah. You you have this book that is out now, and it's a top selling on Amazon and everything. Um, right. Tell me the process for that. Right. Here's my book. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I brought that in here just for you, Dan. Sure. No, I appreciate it. I'm planning on grabbing a copy of my own. <laughs> I'll have one. Uh, it's a story. You know, I had started writing this about a year ago and uh, really could not get anyone interested in the book. And so I self-published the book. And the reason no one was interested is it's a story of my life. It's, uh, I was abused by my mom when I was very young. And it's about my struggles before Bill Clinton as a, an entrepreneur and after Bill Clinton and how I was able to survive. And so I thought it was important enough that I decided to go ahead and, and self-publish the book. And it's just getting very good reviews and, and I'm just very happy about it. That's great. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, well, what else do you have going on right now? Uh, what, what are you, what is the world of, of Juanita in today? Well, summertime, I'm outside mowing about five acres, sure. uh, <laughs> but I do play tennis twice a week, sure. uh, indoors. We have a lovely tennis facility here. I spend a lot of time with my son and my grandson mm -hmm. and uh, I do speaking tours. I'll be in St. Louis next week. Uh, doing a, a big event there, uh, speaking and signing books, cool. and I have so many coming up. So it's it's good. I'm so glad to be out there telling my story. Absolutely, yeah, you're you're doing great, and I'm stoked that you're. Uh, you know, a lot of people that a lot of people would have caved under the the pressure that you've had on you for the vast majority of your life, and you are stronger because of it you've taken hold of it and not let it be uh you know and not let it define you but you define it and you are using it to your benefit which i think is absolutely amazing well i appreciate that so much that's very kind and, and people ask me how i did it and i said i don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't know, just hard work <laughs> sure yeah absolutely well i need to tell everybody uh where they can find more information about you where they can get a copy of your book and anything else that you'd like to Sure. Okay. I have a website and it's JuanitaBroderick.com. And I have interviews on there. I even have a very good interview with my son who was uh, interviewed by uh, uh, Larry King shortly after my Dateline interview. Excellent interview. And documents and, and correspondence. And it also has a link to buy the book on Amazon. Well, Juanita, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. And if you'd ever like to come on again, you're always more than welcome here. Well, all you got to do is holler. All right. Thank you so much. You have a good day. Thanks, Dan. Da, 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 da. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening. As always, uh, please share the show with a friend or two or three or four this week. Uh, help spread the word and the value of uncomfortable conversations. And this story in particular, uh, pe more people need to hear about this. They're like, Juanita said, there are people who have never even heard that this is a thing, and they need to. Also, if you'd like to support the show, you can do so uh, by joining the Downers Club for as little as $1 per month, four quarters per month, like y y basically free. You can do that by going to tsidpod.com forward slash support. Uh, the club members are the lifeblood of this show. Seriously, you guys are the ones that make it possible to keep going and growing and getting bigger and better guests like Juanita uh, on the show, um, spreading the word and you know constantly improving the quality for your listening and viewing pleasure. 
Club members also receive bonus episodes of the show every single week where we cover the news, hot topics, um, we do movie reviews, we play uncomfortable games like Would You Rather, and much, much more. So again, if you'd like to join the club, just go to tsidpod.com forward slash support. And if you haven't already done so, go join our uncomfortable forum for absolutely free and join the conversation. Talk. You can talk to me, you can talk to all the other downers, and Juanita Broderick is actually now a member of the forum as well, as are most of the guests that I've had on the show. So if you have questions for her that you'd like to ask, you can do so by going to Facebook and just searching for the System is Down forum. It is a closed group, so I'll have to, you'll have to request to join and I'll let you in. But yeah, if you look like a real person, you'll get in right away. But... That's all for me today, guys. Uh, Be sure to like, subscribe, and review the show on all the platforms, iTunes, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and of course, if you are so kind as to invite me back into your ears next week, I'll be here first thing on Monday morning with some more uncomfortable conversations. Until then, question everything and stay uncomfortable. Thanks. This has been a Goulash Media production. Goulashmedia.net This concludes our broadcast day. Click.